So at a high level today, uh, we're going to just talk about machine learning in general, and then we'll look at some different ways to do it on Google Cloud. Uh, the ultimate goal of my presentation is just to show you how to get started uh, with machine learning on the Google Cloud, but uh, towards that end, we'll sort of spend a bunch of time on sort of the background, the theory of machine learning, we'll say. Uh, sort of try to give you a bird's eye view of this subject, this field. Uh, but from there, then we'll jump over to like some different ways to get started. And then finally, we'll do some Google Cloud demos. Um, and then at the end, I'll just do a quick recap of everything. And uh, if people have questions, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. So here we go. Uh, what is machine learning? Um, to me, it's the, sort of the intersection of this idea of data and statistics and compute power together. Historically, whenever we wanted to do like uh, large-scale data analysis, we basically had to use real-world sampling. So to use an example, we might try to calculate what the average height of people in the United States is. Uh, so towards that end, you would go out and find a group of people, say 100, measure their heights, and then try to extrapolate that to uh, cover the entire United States. Uh, but nowadays, we have computers. And so basically, we can put everybody's height into a gigantic database column and then just run the average there. So computers, while statistics is not a new field, I think this ability to use computers to do them has kind of really changed the powers of what we can do and made many things that were previously very difficult become almost commonplace. Uh, three traditional techniques in machine learning called linear regression, uh, random forests, and then gradient boosted trees. If you're interested in machine learning, uh, these are like the three key techniques you need to know long before you go after anything fancy like neural networks or anything like that. Uh, linear regression is, is conceptually, hopefully, reasonably easy to understand. It's basically just fitting points to a line. Uh, random forests are a technique that a lot, a lot of people have not actually seen, but basically it's a uh, way of using a computer to randomly sample data. And if you have a robust data set, this is actually a really good way to build a fast uh, categorizers and stuff like that. You'll see them a lot in the real world. And then uh, the problem of random force is they sort of break down sometimes. So we have this concept of gradient boosted trees, which just sort of gives us a way to like combine different models together in order to, in theory, get the best of both worlds. The basic problem with all these approaches has historically been what's called high dimensional data. A picture is probably a good example of this. You know, you have like a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. You can sort of analyze the data by looking at the pieces, we'll say, but really you need to sort of see the interconnections, you know. You're not looking for the signal in an individual channel, but rather all of them combined together. So there's a few different ways of dealing with high-dimensional data that have historically been used in machine learning. Uh, there's a technique called principal component analysis, which is kind of a statistical approach. Uh, there's this thing called singular value decomposition, which is kind of like a mathy version of the same thing, we'll say, uh, to try and collapse large high dimensional data down. Uh, the other trick things you get into is what's called kernel methods. This is sort of where you start to use mathematical tricks to try and change the, the space of the data that you're analyzing. And then finally, you get into full-blown feature engineering, which is where you're sort of like trying to apply human brain power, we'll say, to try and modify the data set to make it something easier for the computer to understand. A good example of this would be like language recognition. You know, we think of words as being like combinations of letters, but the way we actually speak is combinations of what are called phonemes. And so by modeling the speech at that level, you can actually significantly improve your results. Uh, but everything up here, we'll say, is roughly the state of the art as of uh, the year 2000 or so. Uh, so today we're going to talk a lot about neural networks. This is kind of a new area that's become very popular the last few years. Uh, conceptually, 
the very basic form of a neural network is just a mathematical function. It takes a weight times an input and then adds a bias variable. Quite literally, this becomes AX plus B if you look at how it's implemented mathematically. Uh, but what's interesting is by combining many of these different uh, individual neurons together with activation functions, we can actually start to map to infinite data. So many of these problems that historically the traditional machine learning approaches which try to reduce things down to a single dimension, they hit their limitations, this sort of goes in the opposite direction. The problem though is that neural networks are really expensive to build and train. So historically, they've not been used as much. So then we kind of get into deep learning. This is a kind of a field that's kind of blown up in the last few years. I don't really think that, you know, I don't really think there was one thing that in particular that happened to cause all this, but I sort of think it was all these things together. Uh, Compute power has gotten really cheap. You know, multi-core CPUs have gotten really popular. And then now we're using these GPUs as sort of coprocessors. And so we're able to do lots and lots of math on demand very cheaply. Uh, there's this whole big data thing. You know, collecting large data sets used to be difficult. If you had a thousand data, data samples or even a million, that was considered a lot. Now there's data sets with billions or even trillions of data points in them. Um, this is something uh, types, we'll say. Uh, a, a lot of work has gone into improving sensors and things like that. And so we're able to like access all sorts of data nowadays that were historically would have been very expensive, but now it's very easy to gather. Uh, and then sort of the other area of this is that we can do data at much higher resolutions now. Like you used to have to model audio at a very l low uh, resolution, whereas now modern computers can basically model it at a level that even humans can't even understand. The other big thing that's happened is that we've gotten really good at building these sort of large scale software things. It used to be difficult to, to build things larger than say one computer, but now with Google Cloud and these various other sort of technologies, it's easy to spin up a cluster to run the, these sort of things. And then finally, I think the big thing that's happened is they're starting to become this sort of commercial applications of neural networks and machine learning in general. Uh, what this means is that uh, the, 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 uh, what this means is that the, um, uh, while the goalposts are oftentimes a little bit simpler nowadays, the, there's a real world applications of things. So for example, we might take search, and so now every time Google can make a slightly better language model, they can improve their search engine. And so as a result, they're putting lots and lots of resources into building bigger and better neural networks. The other thing, though, I'll say, is there's this essay on the internet called The Bitter Lesson of Machine Learning. What it says is basically the last 70 or so years of machine learning has been people trying to build more and more complicated models in order to do all this stuff. But the sort of fundamental recognition of this whole big data thing, or deep learning, is that simple models that are built up large will usually do way better than complicated approaches. Uh, this is a point we'll come back to again here in a second. Uh, so now let's look at some different examples of actual real-world neural networks. Uh, convolutional neural networks are one of the historically most well understood and best, best way to really introduce this field, I think. Uh, conceptually, we have sort of some different networks here. Uh, Perceptron, this is the actual invention of neural networks from 1957, so this field's not quite as new as you might think. Uh, with this feed-forward network, we sort of have a layer of neurons in between our input and our output. And if you look at this deep feed-forward thing, you can sort of say that we have two layers of neurons between our input and our output. Uh, this sort of approach is really, really common in this field, and you'll see it all over. So I think this basic idea is important to understand. If we take this sort of deep feed-forward network, 
we can then simply add convolutions on top. And so we take our input picture, run things through a set of convolutions, and then we use our two layers of neural network, uh, hidden layers at the end, in order to actually make sense of what the network's seeing. Uh, so this is the BGG image recognition network. This is from 2014, but I think conceptually it's reasonably easy for you to understand. We take an input way over here on the left side, uh, we, we map it in, we run some convolutions and then we squash it down a little bit. We run some more convolutions and squash it down again. More convolutions, squash, more convolutions, squash, and then finally at the end we run it through a couple layers of uh, densely connected nodes, or fully connected layers as they're called, and then finally we can output our prediction for whatever we're looking at, like a cat or a dog in this example. Uh, this network uh, looks pretty simple, but this is actually the state of the art in the field as of about five years ago. And so uh, I think it's a really good way to conceptually sort of see where things have come from. The other big area I think you need to know about is what's called recurrent neural networks. Uh, whenever people draw these, they usually use this rolled form over here, sort of input mapping to an output. Uh, I really don't like this model, or I, I really don't like this way of presenting it because I feel like it sort of makes it much more uh, complicated than you really should be. So whenever I think about recurrent neural networks, I really like to use this unrolled form. So we sort of have an input mapping to an output. We have a second input mapping to a second output. And we have a third input mapping to a third output. And then so on and so forth. But then you can see with this little set of red lines on the left, right side that the sort of output of the second level is not only the input for the second spot, but it's also a little bit of the previous one and so on and so forth. I think if you take this idea and then you look at like the Seek to Seek paper, which came out in 2014, you can kind of see this same idea. We have an input, ABC, and then we're trying to get an output, XYZ, we'll say. Uh, so what they did with this paper is they sort of remap the output as the second set of the data into the input. Uh, so the idea then is we can take a sentence like, I am a student, and we can map it to the output in Spanish, yo soy estudiante, and by combining these two together, then we can show it a new sentence, you know, I am a teacher, and it would be able to correctly predict what the output for that uh, S Spanish version of that sentence would be. Uh, so this is a really important paper in this field, and I think it's a really good jumping off place for uh, recurrent neural networks in general. Uh, so this is a paper that came out of Facebook last month. Uh, I don't think you really need to understand it per se, uh, but I, the reason I threw it up here is kind of you can see that a lot of modern networks kind of use these ideas all together. If you look over here on the upper left, what they're literally using is a convolutional neural network, just like the VGG network we used before to sort of look at the image initially. Then if you look over here at these encoder-decoder steps, they're using a transformer, which is like a fancy version of our RNN network, to actually sort of figure out what the uh, boxes should be for this object detection network. So sort of by combining these convolutional techniques with these recurrent techniques, they're able to produce a state-of-the-art uh, object detection network. So we might, we might call, you know, so we might think of this as combining different pieces of neural networks together to make a larger neural network. Uh, if we can imagine combining neural networks together, uh, pieces of neural networks together, then we can start to imagine combining multiple neural networks together. So generative adversarial networks, or GANs as they're often called, are from 2014, so this is another technique that's about five years ago. Uh, the picture I'm demoing here is StyleGAN, which is a couple of years ago from old now at this point. But conceptually, what you're looking at here 
is the computer is sort of, we'll say, hallucinating. Complicated slide, we'll say. But what we're looking at here is the, uh, the training loss of a GAN network as it trains. Uh, the key idea I want you to get out of this is this little star down here where we see the orange network and the blue network sort of switch places. Uh, conceptually, one network learns, and then after a while it reaches sort of a stable state, and then the second network can start to learn from it. And so that's what we're seeing right here, where this orange overlaps this blue, blue part by this star. Um, the reason I think this is important is then we can start to look at like full-blown reinforcement learning papers uh, so this is the Alpha Zero engine from 2018. But conceptually, if you look over here on the left, it's just a really, really large convolutional neural network, much like the ones we looked at before. The key concept then, if we look over here on the right, or sorry, on the left, on the right, sorry, is this idea over here where the, where the star is at. So this network is actually not that clever, we'll say. Or whenever it tries to learn the game of Go, it actually doesn't do that good of a job. It, it's much simpler than the other approach, which is this purple line over here. Uh, but conceptually, this approach is simpler, but as a result, it also scales better. So ultimately, we'll say 20 hours or a day into training, it's able to surpass the previous state of the art, which would be the AlphaGo, Lee engine, and then ultimately it's able to uh, learn to play Go on a level beyond any human player has ever done so before. Uh, so, but conceptually, it's just a lot of reinforcement learning, you know, neural networks sort of battling each other to, to p based around a CNN style architecture. Uh, and so then we can also look at like the Alpha Star paper, which came out last year. This is where they're training a bot to play the game of StarCraft. But to me, though, if you look at this network over here, while it looks pretty complicated, if you look by the star here at its core, it's a recurrent neural network with a bunch of fancy inputs and outputs. So conceptually, it's just a large-scale version of the recurrent neural network that we looked at before. Uh, if you look at the upper right up here, what you can see is sort of the training process of this network. Each of these lines is a different bot that sort of learns a strategy and then uses it to beat the other uh, players, so to speak. And then over time, the bot learns strategies to beat the bots that have learned the strategies. And so we ultimately get this set of neural network agents that are able to play the game at a level that's competitive with humans. That's what the progression of this chart is showing. Which then leads us to this question of artificial general intelligence, or AGI as it's sometimes called. Is the key to developing AI just having lots and lots of compute power? I think this is really an interesting question, and one that's going to be really interesting to explore in the upcoming decade. I think the basic question is really almost existential, which is that, are humans special? You know, do we have this ability to think and whatnot? You know, but is, is that something that's innate to us, we'll say? Or is it simply, we'll say, an emergent behavior from having a certain amount of uh, computational uh, density? Having studied a little bit of physics and uh, biology, I would say that Mother Nature does not give up her secrets easily, to quote a famous scientist. So I don't know that we'll necessarily figure this out anytime soon. But conceptually, if you think that if AI is possible, then by extension, I think it becomes the most important question of our time. I, I don't really know whether or not these, you know, to me, I'm honest, I'm on the fence, we'll say, on all this. But I will say that nothing I've shown you today was possible 10 years ago. And so by, by extension of that, I think people can't really even predict 10 years ahead in this field right now. So to me, this upcoming decade is going to be really, really, really interesting for the world of machine learning. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a, a, a quick breath here. Um, hopefully, I've sort of uh, shown you some different areas in machine learning, we'll say, and what's 
going on right now. Uh, but my, but the flip side is this, is I don't want you to think that all this is out of your reach. So to quote uh, Douglas, Douglas Adams, yeah, don't panic. Anybody can do this stuff. You know, you don't need a PhD. You don't need to, you know, it, it's just a very fancy form of programming, but conceptually it's, it's accessible to all of you. Now, the second level I would say is that you can learn the basics of this field for free on your own. You don't need a, uh, a fancy computer or any of this stuff. You just need a little bit of time. And then broadly, my advice is always to people just to focus on the fundamentals, and get the basics down, and then you can slowly add complexity. And the other thing I would say would be kind of to follow the herd, we'll say. You know, there's a lot of research and stuff going on in this field. And so I think if you just try to keep up with what's going on, you'll learn a lot that way. A lot of people try to, you know, forge ahead or figure out new things. But I think, to be honest, you would, it's much, much better approach just to try and look at what other people are doing and see if you can figure out ways to apply it to your own stuff. Um, so if you're interested in learning machine learning, I, I think basically you need to, to, to do these three things. You need to pick a framework, uh, which I think should be probably narrowed down to TensorFlow and PyTorch, which we'll talk more about here in a second. Uh, you need to pick a tool, which is just a place to actually run your, your code. Uh, Google Code Lab, which we'll show you in here in a bit, or you can run it on Google Cloud proper, which we'll look at as well. And then finally, you can also run it on your own machine if you know how to build one. And then I think you need to pick a teacher or an approach, you know, a learning process that works for you. So TensorFlow, maybe you were well aware of it, uh, is a pretty well understood library in this space from Google. Uh, TensorFlow 1.0, or one, there, there's a bunch of different versions of TensorFlow 1. About a year ago, they came out with TensorFlow 2. And I think in the last, you know, six months or so, it's gotten pretty solid and pretty well hammered on, we'll say. So my advice to you would be just to start with TensorFlow 2.2, which came out a couple months ago, and then use it with Python 3. Uh, in general, though, I would advise you not to use the raw TensorFlow, we'll say. I think using Keras, which is this high-level API, which is part of TensorFlow, is really the best way to use it. Uh, what I have over here is sort of a picture, an example of a simple uh, neural network that you could build with Keras and then run on your computer. Uh, there's a different set of courses on this, but uh, Coursera and then Andrew NG has this whole deep learning.ai thing. I think that's really uh, a solid way to learn TensorFlow. They have a lot of videos, they have little notebooks you can look at. Uh, there's a lot of other people taking the course so you can answer questions on the internet. And so in general, I think it's a solid approach if you're wanting to, to go with TensorFlow. And now Google's had this little program where they're starting to have certificates. So basically after doing the course, you can answer a bunch of questions and then they'll give you this little uh, thing that you can print out if that's your style. Uh, I would label this approach a little bit more academic, we'll say. You know, they kind of explain the math and stuff like that, but I think it's all very approachable, as accessible. Uh, PyTorch is the other big machine learning library I think you should be aware of. Uh, over here we have sort of a different, uh, kind of how PyTorch would do a neural network similar to the one we looked at on the last slide. I think the best way to get going with PyTorch is Jeremy Howard's and his Fast AI set of series. Um, but it, it's a little less, uh, uh, a little more seat of your pants, perhaps. You know, PyTorch in general is, is still maturing, we'll say. But I think on the flip side, if you like that sort of, you know, uh, ad hoc sort of approach or getting your hands dirty, then I think this is a really valuable tool to have in your toolbox as well. And then you kind of get into the, we'll say, the frontier. Uh, there's a bunch of other frameworks in this space, 
But for me, it's kind of hard for me to, to recommend that you start with one of those if you haven't mastered one of these other ones first. So, uh, you know, Amazon has a framework called uh, MXNet. Uh, there's, there's various other flat patterns out there, but I, I think in general, TensorFlow and PyTorch are going to be your best bets. Uh, there's a couple interesting projects from Google that I think you should have on your radar. Uh, the core of TensorFlow, or the way it actually runs math, we'll say, is this library called XLA. So Google has this project called JAX, which is a NumPy to XLA bridge, if you're familiar with NumPy. Uh, this basically lets you write reasonably simple math-looking code, and then you can run it on GPUs very easily. So if that if you like to get your go down to the to the raw math, this is like a really good trick to have in your tool toolbox. Uh, the other interesting project that's out there is Swift for TensorFlow. This is you combining with XLA as well, and then kind of because it's built into the compiler, you get automatic differentiation, and you get some type safety and checking and sort of functional style programming approach to make the process of building these networks a little bit simpler. Uh, this is where I've spent a lot of time this last year. I've been working on this book on the subject. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to this website and sign up and eventually uh, I'll send an email out whenever the book gets closer to being publication. But hopefully it will be out later this year. Okay, so let's do some demos of Google Cloud. I think these are the five basic uh, Google Cloud techniques that you should be aware of, and I think they're all kind of related, and you should be able to find a way to use one of these of your own. Uh, we'll look at Google Code Lab proper, which is just their way of running notebooks in the cloud. Uh, we'll look at Kubeflow, which is kind of a new project to make it easier for you to run notebooks yourself. Uh, we'll look at the, just the Google Cloud Vision tools, sort of just their REST API for things. And then finally, we'll look at start at how you could actually build your own deep learning AMIs and then actually build your own custom virtual machines. So here we go. So this is Google Colab. Hopefully it will load here in a second. Okay. And what's nice about this is it's just a it's just running Python up in the cloud. Uh, you can just basically go in here, copy paste code from the internet, and then hit the run button, and it'll run for you. Uh, they have this whole runtime thing right here. So basically you can click this button right here and now you can get access to GPUs and TPUs even for free. Okay, so what's nice now if we hit the So Google's given us access to a, a GPU in the cloud for free. So you can actually do a whole bunch of stuff just using these simple Colab notebooks without actually spending any money. You know. So for example, you can go to Keras, their documentation will say, you can just copy paste things off the internet and then hit the run button. And we'll wait a few seconds for it to get going. But here we go. So now we're doing machine learning in the cloud. And all we really have to do is know how to do is just click around a web browser a little bit. Um, Kubeflow, uh, this is an open source project, we'll say. Uh, but basically, it's a way to, to build, to, to run uh, these sort of notebooks and stuff on top of uh, Kubernetes, 
which is a, 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 a platform for building cloud stuff. Uh, so basically you can download this and run it on your own machine if you want. Or um, Google has it inside their Google Cloud platform as part of their AI platform. Uh, so basically, you can go on here and create new uh, new little bitty notebooks like this. So basically, you would go here and create it with a T4 TPU. It'll pop up this thing. But what's nice is all this sort of uh, uh, logic and you know bundling all this stuff together has been figured out for you. So you would just hit the create button and then you would have a new cloud instance. So I did that a little while back. So it's just running here in the cloud. So then we can just open it up. And so just like before, we can copy paste our code in here. And now we can run a demo. And just like before where we were using the Google Code Lab, but now we're using a T4, which is a little bit faster. We'll give it another second or two to get going, and voila, now we're doing machine learning using the AI notebook functionality in Google Cloud. The next big area I think you should know is this whole area of what are called the Cloud Vision APIs. Basically, you can install a Python library. They have various other backends, but we'll look at just Python right here. Uh, and then basically, you can import your library, give it an image, and then basically you can just make a call in your Python scripts in order to access Google's remote APIs to do stuff with your image, for example. Uh, what's nice about this, then, is that Google has all sorts of uh, pre-built pre things, we'll say, different school, different techniques. And so to use an example of something that's, I think, pretty practical, you might need to uh, have people uploading pictures of themselves, we'll say. But you might not want them to take pictures of their, uh, their naughty bits, so to speak. So what's nice about this, then, is basically you can call this little cloud vision thing on the image, right? And it can tell you whether or not it thinks it's an adult image. So this means that you can add some pretty clever AI to, like, say, a web page or something pretty easily, I would say. And like I said, they have Python libraries, but they have everything else. So, for example, if you're a JavaScript developer, you know, you could literally add these five lines of code to your JavaScript project, and then now you're using uh, Google's AI on your back end. Uh, like I said, they have many different uh, features of this API, and so if you're just looking for a one-off thing or just need want to add one little trick to your project, I think this is a really good thing to have in your toolbox as well. And then finally we get into uh, sort of building your own virtual machines to solve these sort of problems yourself. Uh, let this thing load here one second. Um, and then you can type in deep, deep learning. Oops. And you can get this deep learning VM. Uh, what's nice about this is it has the same sort of pre-configured stacks as the code we were looking at before. So if you can get your code working in a Jupyter Notebook, then you can use this sort of uh, pre-configured framework here to get things running in the cloud very easily. So here's literally all the same options. And then what also I like is if you have code that's tied to a specific version of CUDA, or a specific version of TensorFlow, with a few clicks you can get a base install working with this right here. And then finally, you can actually build your own machines to do your AI stuff on your own. 
So I pre-configured a machine right here, and it's going to be running Swift in the cloud. And then I've gone over here, and I've created a cloud TPU to work with it. So we have a TPU running, and then we have a virtual machine. Then we can go here and run our same MNIST demo. We'll give it a second to catch up. Uh, but now we're running a, our MNIST demo that we were looking at before, but we're using Swift in order to run it on a TPU in the cloud. So that's one of the big reasons why I'm excited about all of this. Anyway, we can let it run for a little while, and it'll get up to 98% accuracy. Uh, so to recap, uh, we sort of looked at what machine learning is. We've looked at deep learning and some different variants of neural networks. I've shown you some tools and different ways to get going, and I've shown you some different cloud-based approaches that you can utilize today if you want. Uh, and Google Cloud, if you sign up, you get $300 in free credits, which can really go a long way if you're careful of how you spend it. Uh, with that, I'll say uh, thank you all for listening, and uh, happy to try and answer some questions.